So I'm going to say a few words before we have our next speaker. Cindy Ness, Cindy Ness, uh, Ann asked me to say a few words about my experience. My name is Rick Shapiro. I'm a board member. I've been coming here since 2010. And in 1996, my father died of cancer. That got me into the cancer world. Prior to that, he had had prostate cancer and breast cancer, which afflicts about 1% to 2% of men. So in 1996, he passed away. And it was a tough time because he was kind of a heroic figure to me. He was just an incredibly wonderful human being. I wondered when I saw him go through one cycle of chemotherapy, and he was at a hospital on Shea Boulevard in Scottsdale, Arizona. The one cycle almost killed him. And <clears throat> the nurses thought he wouldn't survive 48 hours. So I'm a guy who digs in and does serious research. So I found a website called PubMed.gov, which is the online library with over 30 million studies under the auspices of the National Institute of Health. And you can put things in the search, in it, search engine and find incredible information. So time went on, and it was suddenly 2001, and I decided I wanted to increase my life insurance. So the nurse comes to my office and takes blood, and they came back and said, we'll give you life insurance, but you're not going to get the premier rates. And I said, why not? I'm the healthiest guy in the world. And they said, your liver enzymes are high. And I went to my doctor and I said, is this something or is this nothing? And he said, send me the data. And I sent him the blood reports. And my numbers were in the stratosphere. He did a, a, um, an ultrasound, a CAT, a, CAT span, a CAT scan, and took about eight vials of blood out of me. And we went on another 30 days. And he said, come back in 30 days. And at that point, my liver was hurting every single day. 12 times a day, it felt like someone was squeezing my liver with, liver with a vice. Went to a specialist. He did some more testing. And he said he wanted to do a biopsy on my liver. And those were words that scared me. I said, give me 30 days. And if my numbers keep going up, I will come back and we'll do the biopsy. Because biopsies of one's liver are not the most pleasant thing. So I found a book by an Australian doctor and a doctor in Europe that talked about the power of nutrition. And in those days, I really enjoyed my standard American diet. And if you think about the acronym, standard American diet, it's pretty sad. So SAD. I, at that point, made major transformational nutritional changes and started eating a lot of food, not processed stuff, not refined junk. And a lot of what we eat is really junk food, which is really deleterious and harmful to our health. And eliminated that and ate a lot of food, which was helpful to me. So in 30 days, I radically moved my numbers, which were in the stratosphere, with pain in my liver. And I felt much better. In six months, my numbers were down to normal, no biopsy. I guess I didn't have liver cancer, but I was trending in the wrong direction. So I was thinking, can one alter the disease process through nutritional and botanical measures, because I also added some botanicals and, and vitamins and herbs to my diet on a daily basis. So then 2010 came along, and I started doing more research about integrative and alternative therapies. And I found on the web something called the Annie Appleseed Project. And I wondered, do they, do they grow apple trees? What are they all about? And I got somebody on the phone named Ann Fonfa. And I incessantly questioned her for three weeks in a row about this conference. And I was interested and curious, but also a little skeptical. I came from a conventional world. So Anne, this woman named Anne Fonfa, was very patient with me, answered my questions. And she said, I really think you should come out. And I live in Scottsdale, Arizona. So I said, OK. Lo and behold, I got on an airplane. I came to Scottsdale. This is in 2010. And when I got back on the plane three days later, I said, there really is something to this. There really is something to this. Uh, that was 12 year, 13 years ago now. So I then decided at that point in time that a lot of people in the world don't know about the fact, and I use the word fact, not just the notion, that there are therapies and treatments outside of strict standard of care that can be profoundly beneficial to one's health outcome without question. You may be here. Some of you who are here for the first time might wonder about that. But I guarantee you, I challenge you, by the time Saturday comes along, come see me 
and let me know if you think that your minds have been uh, transformed into a more positive perspective about what you can achieve health-wise with certain changes. So I'm here to tell you unequivocally, unambiguously, and without any doubt, that you should not assume that any doctor who says you have an expiration date, uh, it, he or she is wrong, because I know so many people who have beat the odds. That led me, in fact, after coming to this conference and meeting people throughout the country uh, and talking to some of the finest doctors and healthcare practitioners on the planet who I, be, I have befriended to write a book called Hope Never Dies. In the book, I interviewed 20 people who were told that they had literally three weeks to live, three months to live, six months to live, one year to live by major cancer centers. I don't name the cancer centers in the book, but if you want to ask me who they are, I'll be happy to tell you verbally. These 20 people had pancreatic cancer, glioblastoma, breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, melanoma, ovarian cancer, and were given short time frames to live. They were told to get their affairs in order. 18 out of 20 of those people I know are still thriving. Two of them, one passed away at the age of 88. He was diagnosed in 1960. And there was a woman in the book who uh, thrived for 25 years who passed away a couple of years ago. But these are people who are thriving, real people. There are thousands of people like that around the country. I probably have met at least 500 personally face to face. And there are people right here at the conference today, tomorrow, and the next day who you might meet and talk to who walk in those incredible shoes. So I'm here to tell you that by implementing various evidence-based therapies and treatments, and based on objective criteria, blood work, other kinds of work, tissue samples, that there is incredible hope. Don't let anyone tell you you've got six months to live because they're working in a siloed myopic world in my perspective. Now, I've got a conventional doctor and actually I have a naturopath, both, and I listen to each and I do my own research. But don't let someone tell you, I was on the airplane flying here, I sat next to a doctor and after part of the flight, the conversation segued into cancer and why I was coming to West Palm Beach and his wife said to me, who sat next to me, well, we don't want to give anybody false hope. And we think that a lot of this is not evidence-based. Well, they perceive things from a, an evidence-based world, which is a pharmaceutical world. If it's not a large, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial or test, which according to Tufts University costs $2.5 billion to bring about from inception to drug approval. There's a study you can all see on, on Google about that. Um, and why do they spend a billion or two billion dollars? Because it's something called a patent, which they can have for 20 years that protects that drug. Think about today, how often we see advertisements on TV about drugs. Did you see those advertisements 20 years ago? They didn't exist 20 years ago. So the pharmaceutical business is a big business. Now there are very good drugs out there. I'm not indicting conventional medicine or drugs. But I'm just saying there are so many things we can bring to the table and implement to profoundly impact our health. So I said to her when she said, we don't want to promote false hope. I said, we don't want to promote false hopelessness, false hopelessness. And she didn't really know what to say, nor did her husband doctor. So I'm just saying, as, as in the name of my book, hope never dies. Don't let anyone tell you that you have an expiration on your life. So I wish you all the best and have a great conference. Thank you. Is Cindy Ness in the room? Cindy Ness is in the room. So I just want to welcome Cindy up here. Cindy has a PhD, and Cindy's bio is in the book, is in the book. And <clears throat> despite the fact we focus frequently on the tumor and how to eradicate tumors or mitigate tumor size, she's going to talk about the profoundly important concept and notion that emotional and, self, emotional and social well-being helps people to survive physical illness. So the mind is a powerful tool that can help us beat disease and bring about much better outcomes. So without further ado, Cindy, the floor is yours. <laughs> 